everything right now. So, uh, you know, that's the way I feel about this. If we can do it for free, we do it for free. Right. That's, that's always been uh, our policy as well. This is taking a long time for Zoom to go live here. That's okay. Not quite sure what's going on. All right. I think we are now live on Zoom and on Facebook. I have to refresh. All right, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our the second of our Women Leaders in Conservation series. We have a very special guest uh, from White Memorial, Jerry Griswold, who is an educator, a rehabilitator, um, from my understanding, a chef extraordinaire, uh, radio <laughs> radio killed, personality. I haven't killed anybody yet, <laughs> anybody yet Russ. <laughs> Not All I of the above. Um, <laughs> So I wanna remind everyone, these programs are happening on Saturdays at 10 o'clock. If you miss a program live, it does get put up on our YouTube channel, Meg's Point Nature Center's YouTube channel. Uh, it may take a, a week or so for that to get onto YouTube, but you can look for the past programs there. I also do Facebook Live presentations every Tuesday through Friday at 11 o'clock. So you can uh, tune into those and again, you can see those videos on the YouTube channel. Uh, there are over 280 on our YouTube channel, but you can also see the videos with additional educational content on our website, nextpointnaturecenter.org. If you visit the virtual learning center, you will see those videos and we'll have vocabulary lists, and word searches and fun games and things to go along with them. So before I, hand it off to Jerry. I just want to say, since we're coming up on Martin Luther King Day, um, and he had many amazing quotes, but the one that I want to ask everybody today, the question that he asked is, what are you doing for others? I love that quote. I have always try and think of what I can do to help the people around me, so I hope that you do the same. And with that, let's hand it off to Jerry. If anybody has any questions, you can put them up on the chat. You can do a question and answer on Facebook Live, and I'll interrupt and, and ask the questions as we go. So you, it's all you, Jerry. Great. Thanks a lot, Russ. Thank you so much for having me. You know how much I love Meg's Point, and I love collaborating with you guys. And I'm so grateful to be here today to uh, tell you a little bit of the story of Margaret Whitlock White. And um, one of the important things to remember about the White Memorial Foundation and Conservation Center is we are not a state park, we're not state owned. Uh, when May and her brother Elaine passed away, uh, they left a mighty endowment and it is managed today by a wonderful board. I mean, I know a lot of people can't say they have a wonderful board. I have the best board in the world. And, um, and so that's how we are the largest privately or why we are the largest privately held wildlife sanctuary in our state. We're over 4,000 acres of open space. We just acquired a little bit more um, whenever the foundation can uh, buy up more land that abuts our original property. They try to, of course, in this day and age, real estate comes at a premium, but they still manage to pick up a 15 acre parcel here or a six acre parcel there, and we continue to grow. So we are currently in Bantam. We are always going to be in Bantam, Morris and Litchfield. Uh, we're over 4,000 acres of open space, a bit over 40 miles of hiking trails. We have family campgrounds, which of course, you know, everything with COVID is sort of hinging on, well, Point Valley is going to be open this summer, but it's probably going to be very limited in that because of COVID, we have to limit it. And we have um, uh, nonprofit campgrounds, campgrounds that we allow nonprofit organizations to use for free, but not of course during COVID. Um, you can't even use an outhouse now on the property thanks to COVID, but we invite you out to the sanctuary 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, bring your dog on a lead. We have a, a place where you can park your trailer if you're an equestrian. 
um, and bring your snowshoes. We don't have any snow right now, but, uh, and this is really going to ruin it today, but this is a wonderland. It is because of May and her brother Elaine that the face of Northwestern Connecticut changed forever in so many ways, not just in the parcel of land that we call the White Memorial Foundation today, but in the other gifts that they gave to the state of Connecticut, which are probably some state parks that you have visited and that you know and you love. Interestingly enough, a lot of their story is lost. And um, I was just telling Russ before we started that I was talking to a local historian yesterday and it's like, I don't even know where May is buried. And thankfully for Lee Swift, this amazing historian, she found exactly, she's a member of Find a Grave, she found exactly where May is buried, but she, May and her brother aren't buried together, which kind of breaks my heart. He's down in South Carolina and she's in the Bronx. Um, they should be together, but they aren't. Uh, because together they created the White Memorial Foundation. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about their life at Whitehall today, and then we're going to launch into what White Memorial is today. Very, very different from Whitehall. So here we go. Um, she was born in 1869 and passed away in Somerville, South Carolina. That was where their summer home was in 1941. So here she is. Um, she was 11 years older than her brother, Elaine. And uh, that is with their father, this is about 1895. That's with their father, John J. White. The family's money came from, believe it or not, fur in the beginning, because if you go to Astor Place in New York City and you are in the subway there, I went to NYU, that's why I was hanging out in the Astor Place subway. You'll see these beautiful tiles of beavers because the Astors made a lot of money selling beaver fur. Well, it wasn't that way for long with the whites. It was law and it was real estate for them. That's how they made their fortune. They had gobs of money. Um, Elaine and May were two of, I believe, uh, six or seven children. And um, maybe their, their mother Louise was already passed away at this point when, the, I don't think so when this picture was taken, but for whatever reason, they are here with their father, John Jay. If any of you uh, have been to Western Connecticut State University, or if you are familiar with the Danbury area, there is a street called White Street there, and that is named after John Jay. So here they are uh, as adults. Um, May looks like she has an otter hound there, carrying a bouquet of hydrangeas, which I would like to believe came from our property. And there's a big hydrangea bush just outside of what was once Whitehall, which is now our museum. And there he is, Elaine. So, you know, when I was invited by Russ and Lori to come and do this program, it's like, well, geez, you know, really Elaine was the force behind the foundation. May was the silent force behind the foundation because in that day and age, except for a couple of the women you're going to find out about through this incredible series that Meg's Point is doing, women were kind of quiet in those days. But I've done some reading lately. One of my favorite things to drink is something I can't afford, it's champagne. And there was a woman in the 1700s in France called the Widow Clicquot, who ran one of the greatest champagne houses in all the world that is still in operation today. And there were women that were running the Moet and Chandon wine house as well. In the 1700s, these women were amazing. Well, May was too, but she wasn't, um, she wasn't vocal. You really, when you hear the story of White Memorial, it's always about Elaine. And you'll understand why this guy was the bomb. But here she was, she took care of him as a child, really, 11 years older. She was the best big sister in the world. And as they got older, things flip flopped and her health started failing. Elaine took care of her. They never married. Elaine was a published botanist. He was um, instrumental in the restoration of wood duck and mallard duck populations with Dylan Ripley. If you're not familiar with the Ripley uh, Waterfowl Conservancy, which is just around the corner from R White Memorial, make yourself familiar with this extraordinary place. So Elaine and Dylan Ripley started uh, protecting wood duck and mallard ducks because all of their feathers were being plucked out and duck was a delicacy, but it mainly was their feathers that were being taken. These birds were almost extinct. And Elaine was instrumental in their um, comeback. We still do a wood duck box survey every year on our, our property, our 4,000 acres of many, many wood duck boxes. He was a chess master and his codes, he was such a brilliant chess master 
that his codes were used in World War II to solve German chess um, uh, codes. So uh, he was an absolutely brilliant man. Um, and we hear a lot about Elaine, but again, there is May, the driving force behind the foundation. And what they did um, in 1913, uh, they, when, when actually it was Elaine was in a boat on a pond called Beaver Pond. You'll see some old pictures of the Five Ponds area today and some newer pictures, of course. He was on a boat with uh, Mitchell Van Winkle, his best friend, and he said something to the effect of, what if we could preserve this land, this water, um, these, this property forever and ever until the end of time? And he and May got together and they parlayed this vision into the White Memorial Foundation that was established in 1913. By the way, our state park system was established in 1913. Their gifts to the state of Connecticut were breathtaking. Not only did they save our 4,000 acres in Litchfield, Bantam, Morris, they were land junkies in a time when no, everybody was doing farming. Nobody was thinking about preserving open space. And here this brother and sister started gobbling up lands, lands that today you know as people, I get goosebumps. I've been working for them for 13 years. It's not because I'm cold. I get goosebumps when I tell this story. They owned Kent Falls. They owned Macedonia State Park. They owned Dean Ravine in Cornwall. They owned um, People's State Forest in Barkhamstead. They owned lands as far as into Farmington, Connecticut, down in Old Lyme, Connecticut, all of it. Here's state of Connecticut, 6,000 acres for you. Turn these into state parks. And that's what happened. So really the whites have their fingerprints all over the state of Connecticut in our state park system. I mean, just some of the most beautiful parks that we have here in our state were once owned by Elaine and May White who were visionary conservationists. Here's a picture of Elaine. This is not his dog, but um, everybody knows her as Countess Elka. And uh, I can't remember what uh, you know, she's a Borzoi, a Russian wolfhound. I can't remember who was the, her owner, but she appears in um, several pictures in our old Whitehall albums that are from 1809 through 1810. This was Whitehall. It was the grandest Victorian home and it was their summer home. They lived in Somerville, South Carolina for the most part in the winter, but they spent the bulk of their time here at Whitehall. Today, Whitehall looks very, very different. It's where our nature museum is. The White Memorial Conservation Center was established in 1964, and it was Elaine and May's vision to educate and to uh, and education, recreation, conservation, and research of the property. Um, so uh, how this house fell into rack and ruin, I'm really not so sure, um, but it did. So it isn't like this at all today even the innards of it. There is some of the original woodwork in our museum. And of course, folks, the museum is closed till further notice because of you know what, I won't say it anymore. Uh, and we don't know when we're going to reopen, but the park is always open. So you can always enjoy the trails, which by the way, through COVID I've realized has been such a blessing for so many people, everybody, even people who didn't believe their roots were in nature, realized that their roots were in nature. And I know that you guys at Meg's point were probably, you know, had zillions of people showing up it was so crazy in, on our trails because the state shut down a lot of our parks, like Kent Falls was closed. A lot of people retreated to White Memorial and we had to close our most popular trail, the Little Pond Boardwalk. It was just a health risk. So this is beautiful White Hall. And another vision through the gardens, the beautiful gardens, um, how manicured and kind of English everything was. And they did uh, their own, here she is again, beautiful Countess Elka. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if those are, I don't know what kind of flowers they are. It looks like there's corn in the back and there's white hall in the back. They did their own maple sugaring. They did their own haying. Obviously there were cows in, on the property. Um, they harvested their own ice and had their own ice house, of course, for refrigeration. And this was right in front of the museum. And that stump that you see is not a stump. It's a trompe l'oeil fountain, a water fountain. It's not working today, but it's still there. So there were uh, just carriage trails in front of the, the house. 
really, I don't even know if you could drive carriages in front of the museum. There was one long sweeping carriage trail uh, to the left of this picture. And I think people were just brought up here, dropped off, and then the carriages went on their merry way. But it was the grandest house. So today you can still see that old cement stump that looks, I think I was there for a while before I realized that it wasn't a real stump. It's, it looks very much like a, a real stump. This is the King's Oak, and I was looking at this picture the other day, and I've seen it a million times, and I realized there are people sitting in that tree. <laughs> the King's Oak is still there today. It looks very different as I was passing it yesterday as I was driving up to the Conservation Center. It's covered in moss. It's surrounded by um, open space now, all trees grown in. Uh, the stone wall has fallen to bits, but it's still there, and we look very, very different today. They took parts of the property, like the Five Ponds area, and they created farces and follies for them. Um, a Japanese tea house at Beaver Pond. The Five Ponds area is called Five Ponds because there are five ponds there, but there are these large sweeping carriage trails, and four of the Five Ponds were created by the Whites. Even Angli Pond, which is in the back of the museum, Angli Pond is a man-made spring-fed pond. So they did some landscape architecture on the property as well to suit their, their needs. Uh, they used it for, they had private clubs and lots of recreation. This is a boating party and look at how risky that is with his legs being shown. And the ladies of course are drawn, you know, are uh, dressed from top to bottom, but they did um, tipping, uh, tilting, I'm sorry, it was a, a, a thing called tilting where people would go out onto Bantam River and Bantam Lake and try to tip each other, always men, tip each other over in the boats. And this was a picnic after one of the tilting parties. And this is a club that's still in, um, it, it still exists today called Sanctum. It's a gentleman's club. Uh, ladies don't get, uh, I don't, you know what? I don't wanna be a part of a club where nobody wants me. I'll start my own club and you can't join. So that's what Sanctum is. And it's, I've actually been in the Sant Sanctum clubhouse uh, in downtown downtown Litchfield. And it's really lovely. And I guess women can come for dinner, but it's still a gentleman's club. That's okay, I don't mind that. But the whites use this property for um, art and for dining. And of course they had a great, great love of nature and felt compelled to preserve it. There's the great man Elaine at a sanctum dinner. They must've been all so drunk and I don't know who was driving the carriages home, but um, I don't know. I, I wasn't there, I'm not going to pass judgment, but Elaine's back is to us. And they loved children. Remember, they none of them, made, neither of them married. And what they did, uh, you know, I think about what Russ's Martin Luther King quote was at the beginning about helping people. What can you do to help people? My God, these people were amazing. Not only did they give us this land, but they just embraced um, all of the local children, every year they would do a huge lemonade and ice cream social for all of the school children in the area. They would bring kids up from New York City to have summer camps on Bantam Lake. Their objective was to obtain 100% of the land around Bantam Lake. Bantam Lake is the largest natural lake in our state. It's 25 feet deep and it's three miles long. And they managed to acquire 60% of the land around Bantam Lake, which today is still owned by the White Memorial Foundation. So you can own a house on Bantam Lake, but your house might be sitting on rented property. I call us like the, the snazziest slum lord in the world. They were the coolest people because they adapted plays. We found a script of Through the Looking Glass that Elaine and May had written. And they would stage these elaborate plays for children in the backyard and, you know, every, with all these paper mache costumes. And um, this is from Through the Looking Glass. And when we found the script for the 100th anniversary of the foundation in 2013, we recreated this uh, as a reader's theater. We didn't learn all the lines and we made up our own crazy costumes. They weren't as elaborate as this. But the backyard, the gardens at Whitehall were used for plays and for entertaining children and um, all sorts of wonderful, whimsical things. These people just could have sat on their fortune and done absolutely nothing, but they didn't. They gave and gave and gave. Here's Elaine on one of the beautiful uh, carriage trails. As you can see, there aren't a lot of pictures of May around, but we do have, this is a picture of the mausoleum, family mausoleum. This is at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. 
And um, she was the co-founder of the White Memorial Foundation and she died here in Litchfield um, in her winter home, uh, Tuesday at her winter home in Somerville, South Carolina after an illness of several years. She was sick for quite a while and he was her caregiver. She and her brother Elaine C. White also donated a tract of land in the Harris Plains section of town to the state upon which the new state police headquarters will be built this spring. And of course it's still there. They donated land for Litchfield High School, for Wamogo uh, um, Boag High School. Um, there was a soccer field, a, a play field that was donated by them. Uh, and again, I just here, take this land and build your school, build your police um, barracks. Um, take this land, do great things with it. She was a native of Litchfield and she lived most of her life in Litchfield, but spent her later years in New York City and Somerville. In 1913, Miss White and her brother created the foundation, which represents about 60% of the shore front of Bantam Lake for recreational and camping purposes and to preserve the natural beauty of the lake. Miss White is the owner of about 4,000 acres of land in Litchfield and Warren. She was a member of St. Michael's Episcopal Church. And besides her brother in Somerville, she leaves two sisters, Mrs. Lucy A. Morris of London, England, and Mrs. Violetta Delafield of New York City. Funeral services will be held Thursday at 3 p.m. at the home of Mrs. Delafield. But of course, we have to um, include Elaine too, who again is buried in Somerville and he died 10 years after uh, she did. Uh, and I just feel so, uh, it makes me sad. I, I really, I really wish he, he could um, be with her, but um, I would love to go and visit both of them. I, I think that they are two of the greatest unsung heroes in terms of land conservation in our, in our state and in our nation. Um, they changed the face of Northwestern Connecticut forever. Uh, they were just truly extraordinary giving benevolent people. Let's visit Whitehall today. So welcome to Wonderland. Um, our land, is, it, the Bantam River goes through White Memorial's property and of course spills down onto Bantam Lake and a, a man named Horst Antosh took this picture. He is a, a, quite a world explorer. He now lives in Hawaii near his son. And Ms. Horst is a sommelier and um, an explorer and a chef and an incredibly cool photographer. And he took this photograph very early in the morning on the Bantam River. Horst has uh, traveled with his portable kayak to American Samoa. He's gone all over the world with this boat. And he said of all the rivers in the world, he thinks the Bantam is the most beautiful because of the relationship that he has with the animals. And he said, you have to go early in the morning. And when you're down at their level, they seem more forgiving. And this great blue heron actually landed on his kayak at one point and took a ride down the river with him. It's just incredible. He truly believed that there was, there was something magical about the Bantam River. Um, obviously, no hunting is done on the property. We still do. We do some parts of, um, we do some forestry. And of course, with uh, the Eastern Ash Borer, now um, the, excuse me, Emerald Ash Borer, uh, all of our ash trees are, are coming down. If they haven't been harvested yet, we still have some big ones in front of the museum, which sadly we're going to lose. And they really define the topography of our nature center, but they'll, they'll have to go because this insect has just destroyed all of them. But this is a preservation, this is a preserve for everybody, no matter whether you're a plant and you can't speak, or a, a child or a hundred year old person or a turtle or a gray tree frog, a snapping turtle or an American toad, this is for you too. Leo Kalinske Jr., I call him the court photographer of White Memorial, so this presentation is filled with his photographs. Leo's out on our trails almost every single morning. He's a, a self-published author in terms of his photography, but he's also published in books about running because he is a, a, a runner and uh, has run in the Boston Marathon, the New York Marathon. He's now 70. He's still running, but he's not doing races of that caliber anymore. And again, uh, just a, an extraordinary wildlife photographer. Bantam Lake is a, you know, a place where everybody loves to go paddling. This is our education director, Carrie Schved, with one of our white pines. I didn't know white pines grew this big until I, I went to White Memorial. I had no idea. Still have lots of them. All, of course, all of our red, red pines have, have passed on. I won't talk through all of these. I am a talker and I can filibuster. So just enjoy the beauty of our sanctuary. 
a woman named Judith Erman Shapiro does virtual yoga programs for us every Tuesday. And these were all taken by Judith. She's a pretty dandy photographer. I'm especially fond of that little white pine popping up through the snow. One of our state uh, workers, Paul Fusco, who has a zoom lens that, I don't know, it's about 20 feet long. He could, oh my God, he's just incredible. Paul took this of a great horned owlet. Our place is a mecca for birders as well. This is one of Leo's. I took this picture of standing on Sutton Bridge on the Little Pond Boardwalk on a beautiful summer day. And I think this is the luckiest person in the world that we're looking at. Going up Bantam River towards Little Pond, all alone, how lucky. This beautiful woman passed away several years ago. Her name was Robin Dinda, and she loved the Bantam River as much as Horace did. did. And um, in 2013, we did a boat parade in honor of Elaine and May, and uh, Robin dressed to the nines, and we had a high tea on Chickadee Bridge where she's standing in this picture. And I can't do a presentation uh, without Robin, but the people that are our members are always really interested in having fun and utilizing the property the way the whites did. Have some fun with it. It's not all about, you know, stodgy research and things like that. Let's have some fun. Lee Swift is on the upper right. Um, she's the reason I had those pictures of the whites' graves. Autumn, of course, my favorite season. And if you come to visit us, and I hope you do, you may encounter this girl. Uh, she's been around since about 2004. Her name is Veronica. She's a wild hawk, a red-tailed hawk, that just kind of uh, decided to make White Memorial her home. Um, she catches snakes and squirrels and has had clutches on our property, but she knows every single person that works for White Memorial. And when she buzzes you, it means that she wants a handout. So we always save a couple of mice for her. We do have a few animals at the Conservation Center, red-tailed hawk, as well as um, a barred owl and some snakes and turtles and uh, spotted salamander. But uh, Veronica comes regularly and begs when she feels like she doesn't want to do any hunting. We think she was probably owned by a falconer at one point. Falconers are allowed to trap a bird. Red tails make an incredible hunting bird and they usually keep them for a season, maybe two years, and then they're set free. She knows us well enough to come to us for a, an offering, but she also knows to stay away from us. Fascinating, and she's still around. She's getting up there in years. Our beautiful green barn is super special. A, it's a beautiful green barn, but for me it's special because we have about 400 big brown bats that roost in here as a maternity colony in the summer, and this is monitored by the state of Connecticut. As I was telling you, Elaine was instrumental in um, wood duck restoration, and uh, we still do a wood duck wet restoration project on our property every year. Uh, and here is a mother with a big clutch. Um, if any of you ever see a duck in a tree, don't think you're crazy. It is a wood duck. Wood ducks actually nest in tree cavities very, very high up. And they will, obviously they're not making, they're, they're taking, op, they're opportunistic. They're taking advantage of a hole that's already created and they will bring in their nesting material and pull out some down and make a nice nest. And these little guys are born there. And how do they get down to the water? They just drop. So you can go on YouTube and see some really cool videos of wood ducks, ducklings leaving the nest and they just are like rubber balls bouncing and then off they go for a life on the water until it's their turn to breed. Vernal pool monitoring is also something that we do at White Memorial. And, uh, you know, again, something very, very important to us to find uh, what reptiles, or not reptiles, amphibians are being affected um, by whatever might be affecting them. And they have had some problems, the amphibians have in, in the past several years. This is Ed Mahowski. He is the head of the DEEP's fisheries department. God, I love this guy. The Connecticut DEEP fisheries and White Memorial have been intertwined for many, many years uh, in that fisheries uses several of the marshes on our property for raising northern pike fry. So what they do, this is the coolest thing. They go out into Bantam Lake in the spring and they will harvest uh, northern pike adults. 
They put them in places like our marsh at Pike Marsh, we call it at Little Left Pike Marsh. And that's where they will um, have their, uh, lay their eggs. And then the big fish are collected and put back into Bantam River. The fry uh, grow up in the marsh, then fisheries goes back in and collects all of them. They don't open up a gate and let them go down the river. Otherwise they're all going to get eaten or they won't get past beaver um, dams along the way. These fish are literally picked up and brought to Bantam Lake and to Winchester Lake and other lakes as well, where they turn into that. So White Memorial, again, plays a really important role in sport fishing in Connecticut. Again, a very silent partnership with the Connecticut DEEP. This is obviously a catch and release fish that was caught on Bantam Lake in 2018. And I just think that's a wonderful story. What a wonderful partnership that we have with the state. Um, one of the things I love to do is bring poetry to the outdoors. And these are students at the Foreman School with my dog, Bradley, who is with me all the time, except for day, today. He's at Camp Daddy in case he got mouthy, he sees squirrels and he makes too much noise. But uh, we did a whole program with the Foreman School students on um, environmental uh, poetry, really. Um, Mary Oliver and David K. Leff and many, many poets that were inspired to write uh, because of nature. And I would bring the students, this is on the Little Pond Boardwalk, to several spots on the property, read poetry to them, which is so much fun. And then they would go back and write their own poetry or their own prose about their experiences. Uh, again, for the whites, it was so important to get children of all ages out and about and get nature ingrained in them. And nobody does it better than our education director, Carrie Schved. She's a dynamo, just a dynamo. So we do run a dearth of programs for adults, but also a lot of programs for children. It's been a struggle virtually for Carrie, not so much for me doing adult programming, but um, she's getting there. And I have never met anybody so out of the box innovative with virtual program programming for children than Carrie. So go on our white website, whitememorialcc.org. Don't take any business away from Russ, but go and see what we have to offer for kids because she's, she's really a spectacular educator. Um, great corned owls like skunks, they eat them a lot. And the people that rehabilitate great horned owls need to be prepared for a great horn that comes in after it's been sprayed by a skunk. But he, Leo was very fortunate to catch this owl who does not have a tail. He's actually on top of a skunk that he just killed. Apple Hill is my favorite. I call it the jewel in the crown on our, our property. Um, it used to be uh, old apple, hill, apple tree fields. And uh, now in the summer, in the spring, it's a place for bobolinks. We're not as big a bobolink uh, viewing area as say Topsmead State Forest, which is around the corner from us. But you can always see bobolinks up here in the spring. And there's this beautiful observatory, a little platform you can walk up on. And just beyond that, that little hump that looks like a pile of dirt is Mount Tom. This is Point Folly, one of our big camping areas for uh, families. Again, get your reservation in really super early. Jerry, where do you have um, boat launches? Do you have them on the river or? On the river? It, on, on, um, there was a state boat launch that they just did a beautiful job restoring right off of Whitehall Road on the Bantam River if you want to go kayaking. You can also launch your uh, kayak and your canoe off of um, North Shore Road. There's another uh, pull off where you can do that. And, and again, it's free. And uh, they also have, um, uh, what do you call them? Berths, not berths, whatever it's called. You can also rent a spot mostly for motor boats, I think, for Bantam, Bantam Lake, because Bantam Lake has all the, the power boats. But you can bring your boat up anytime and just, you can plunk it down anywhere. You don't even have to have an invitation, a place, you know, where it is an official boat launch. You can drop your boat anywhere in the Bantam River you want. This is your property. The Whites left it for you. We do llama walks, and um, this is the Five Ponds area, plunge pool with a little boy who's now a big boy now. Stand uh, sitting up there, he's looking down on plunge pool, and he's sitting on a platform that was created where uh, the whites used to have a, um, it was like almost like a stand, a stanch and a stand, they would drive their horses and carriages up here so they could look down on plunge pool. And plunge pool is one of the five, uh, four of the five man-made ponds um, up at five ponds. There's a uh, beaver pond is the only natural pond. And down on the lower um, right, 
there is Calvin standing on one of the pillars of what was once the old tea house that the whites had overlooking Beaver Pond, uh, which is a natural area. Llama walks, lots of fun. People bring their horses, they dress them up like Santa. Fantastic. I love how people utilize this property. And then we have these wonderful wildlife photographers like Matt Belness, who is just sitting there and here is an otter in his face. Amazing. Between Matt and look at this. I mean, who needs to go anywhere fancy to get a sunset? All you have to do is go to Bantam Lake. This is Curry Walker's picture. To me, this is something that should be in a travel and leisure magazine. Yeah, it's that beautiful. I took both of these. I like, look, I like looking at the minutia of um, nature. And you guys know when you know we first start getting cold and there's my little bit of water in, on a puddle and it freezes overnight, you get these crazy, beautiful patterns. To me, this looks like a peacock feather. Uh, so I, I took that and all those little building blocks in photography is what makes that big picture. So if you are an amateur photographer, look closely at the minutia. It's not always about that big vista, or that big sunset. It's about the little things that compose that, that sunset. You could be finding some of your best photographs in the minutia. This was really terrific because this great horned owl was most accommodating and that she um, laid her two eggs in a place that was very accessible to us. And Leo took some incredible photographs that year. And these two little knuckleheads were, I mean, we followed them from the point of when they were born hatched to the you know, point that they fledged and they were so much fun to watch. Uh, we're very quiet about telling people where animals like this are, even if it is obvious they're around very close to where the museum is, we won't share that information with everybody because you'll get everybody out there and it's too disturbing to the animals. So it's pretty hush hush. Some muskrats. I just like the picture at the top. It's kind of beautiful and eerie. I took that out at Little Pond on a murky day. Rocky is at the bottom. He is our uh, education turtle. He's an Eastern box turtle that sadly was kept in captivity and has a hole in his shell from when somebody put a dog tag on him. Uh, a good Samaritan found him wandering around and the state uh, thought that we should keep him because we didn't know what he had been exposed to. And, um, and so the, the animal will not put, he will not go in his shell. He is a rock star. He is an absolute rock star. He is the most unbox like box turtle. <laughs> He's just a character. I call him a turtle with a soul. Again, the minutia is that little feather, these pretty little components in nature that you see that you might not be looking for. Look for them. For snow. The, up at the top are the pine cones of a larch tree or a tamarack. This is very far south for them. And all the tamaracks on our property were probably put there by the whites. Um, they are an evergreen that loses its needles in the fall. So when you drive by this huge larch on our property right near the museum in the fall, you might think if you don't know the tree that it's sick and dying, but it isn't. It's just turning bright yellow, losing its needles. I love the pine cones. Chickadee Bridge uh, was once a, a regular roadway. I actually know people that used to drive over it not so long ago, but it's decommissioned now. It's a trail. Um, and uh, right over the Bantam River, really beautiful trail. This guy was right outside of the museum and I took this photograph a few years back. And of course, it's all about kids every year, not this year though, we do a museum sleep in where the children get to come in and choose you know, what area of our gorgeous museum they want to sleep over and we feed them wonderful s'mores at a campfire and tell stories and do night hikes and have all sorts of workshops for them. And this was at one of those family nature, uh, not family nature day, at this beautiful uh, museum sleep and that was in its uh, 29th or 30th year before COVID. The other thing we usually do won't be doing this year is a partnering once again with the Connecticut DEP and their volunteers that do a um, water safety program for open water fishing and for ice fishing. And this is the ice fishing workshop that gathers, I don't know how many people every year, 75 or 80 people, families come out to this. And then at the end of a seminar where the children and the adults learn about safety on the ice, they're actually taken out. This was on our own Angli Pond. I, I played with this photograph to make it look more painterly, 
but you get the idea. It's just a joyful, joyful program for families. If you really are tough, we do moonset, sunrise um, hikes, even in the depths of winter. It's not about the weather, it's about the clothes you wear to the top of Apple Hill. And on September 11th every year, I stage a memorial event at the top of Apple Hill using a falconer and live music so that it could be 30 people, it could be five people get to come to Apple Hill to just think, pray, whatever it is that you meditate, whatever it is you wanna do. It's something I feel very strongly about is 9-11 and that we never forget. There was a, an old campground for Girl Scouts called Camp Townsend, and it's no longer there. Some of the buildings, I think recently we just deconstructed them because kids were goofing around there, but it's right on Bantam Lake. And one of the hikes that I lead is to the old uh, Girl Scout camp, just a beautiful place, a beautiful shore right on Bantam Lake. Very few people showed up this day. I don't need a crowd to join me on a hike to know that I hit the ball out of the park. It was, um, just an incredible day with four people. I could have one person on a hike and it could be one of the best days of my life. Matt Bellness, who took that otter picture you just saw, he was sitting one day at one of my favorite places photographing wildlife and this guy was his spirit animal the entire day. <laughs> Little green, I think it's a green frog. Again, people use our property for myriad things and it's called skewering, where you, these are greater Swiss mountain dogs. Um, they're pulling along their lazy um, owners on cross-country skis. It's so much fun to see people doing this. It's not just about snowshoeing and regular cross-country skiing, but people are like, yeah, let's go to White Memorial with the dogs and have them pull us along. Jeff Greenwood was our education director for 37 years and I love him dearly and I'm in touch with him almost every day because I still have questions. He's such a wealth of knowledge, one of the greatest naturalists I think I'll ever meet. But he was replaced by this great naturalist, Carrie Shved, who when I get teared up, a teary every time I think about this, when Jeff left White Memorial and left it in his position in Carrie's hands, he said, I, I know we're going to be okay now. We, we found the person. Um, she reminds me of me when I was her age. So Carrie is such a gifted educator. She's so amazing with children. I, you know, I can't say enough about her. And I can't say enough about James Fisher, our research director, who is a brilliant mind. He's just, the project he has, the projects he has going on every year, from earthworms to ticks, to wood ducks, to bluebirds, to, and the volunteers that he gets to work for him for free. The guy's got, he's magical, super speaker too, incredible biologist. And then you get this joker too. Um, I have no background in nature. I have a degree from New York University in art history. But in 1992, I found a big brown bat pup in my backyard who changed my life, who put me on a course where today, I'm sitting here today because of this bat pup that I found. So <clears throat> I've been working with bats for 28 years now. And I love porcupines too. Well, these are the two animals that I work with primarily. And I'm here today at White Memorial because of the work that I do with bats. It's just amazing that somebody with my background can be a part of this process and this incredible organization. Our trails wouldn't look the way they do without three people in the winter and four people in the summer. So these guys are in charge of unclogging toilets, repairing every single uh, plank on the boardwalk when they break, um, screwing in light bulbs, uh, getting cobwebs out of the museum, and uh, felling trees. And uh, the men that work for the White Memorial Foundation in maintenance are our unsung heroes. A tree falls across a little left, let's go out and we're going to cut it down. I can't even say, everybody says how beautifully maintained our trails are. That comes with blood, sweat, and tears by really 
three people. One guy runs the campground. So in the summer, he's in absentia. These guys are doing all the mowing and everything. You will be amazed by the condition of our trails. And it's done, you would think, by a million people. Mm -mm. A small group of the greatest heroes of White Memorial. Leo, I, what can I say about Leo? He's an incredible. Great blue heron for all of you that may not know. Paul Fusco again, a great horned owl. I took this, somebody came up to my office one day and said, you gotta come down here. There's a praying mantis on somebody's camera and he wants his picture taken. <laughs> praying mantis are people too. Beavers are very prevalent around the foundation. You will see their their blue their fingerprints everywhere. There are certain areas and um, that are natural areas. We let them have their way with it, and a lot of the trees um, have wires around the base of them so that the beavers can't destroy some white oaks and uh, red oaks, some things that are really important. But for the most part, these guys are here to do whatever they want to do. We've had one down at Angli Pond right behind the museum this past year that was almost like a lap dog. Obviously, you never want to touch one of these animals. It's the largest rodent in North America, and they have the teeth that could really do some harm to you. But because this is a sanctuary, wildlife are pretty much in tune with you guys. And so there are great opportunities for you and your family uh, to see animals pretty up close and personal. This is my favorite tree on the property on one of my favorite trails at Camp Cat Swamp. And it is an old oak tree. I call it the brave old oak. And I visit it frequently. Um, I just love this. And I love this photograph, especially because all the little oaks that came from acorns off of that guy, they're like, me next. When you go, I'm ready. No, I'm ready to be you. What an incredible day that was. I've had super experiences. Always bring your tick spray. Watch out, do tick checks. We are the tick capital of the world. This is pretty fascinating because we had recently some bald eagle activity on Bantam Lake. And for years, they were sort of carrying nesting material around, but nothing was happening. And there was a pair, but they weren't laying eggs. And then back in 2017, Leo noticed a little bit more interesting activity. And we realized that for the first time in 150 years, we had a pair of breeding bald eagles on Bantam Lake. And Leo's kind of the godfather of them. He reports to James Fisher, our research director, about their comings and goings. He was able to get a good photograph of the band on the female. We know that she comes from Massachusetts and that um, this is the third year in the row. So 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. They have had two uh, young every year and all of them have been successful. And so, so much for DDT and how it almost annihilated our bird of prey populations, our bald eagles are back. It's almost, they're almost as common as robins now. You see them all the time. Getting children out early in life is what gives them that bond to nature that we all have, why we're all here today, so important. This is a mink that Lois Melorano, who is now retired from wildlife rehab, actually rehabbed. She had four of them, stinkiest things in the world, and let them go on the property. And then people would come up to the museum and say, they're these cute little things that want to be our friends. They were too accustomed to people. So she collected them and released them in a more wild place. And I'm sure they did all very well because they're weasels and weasels do well. James uh, took a picture of this <laughs> gray tree frog on the boardwalk hiding. <laughs> Saw the Bantam River. I adore this. There was a great old ice house that was uh, built on Bantam Lake and the ice from it, it was the size of two football fields and it was 30 feet high and there were dormitories there and the ice that was collected from Bantam Lake um, was sent off to New York City primarily and, and some, most people, like my farm up in Winchester, we had our own ice house. So we would go down to the pond and there was an ice house on the property. My dad actually used to, uh, used to love it because he would go and hide in the ice house in the summer. They would collect these big blocks of ice and then pack them in sawdust and they would stay frozen forever. Well, this is one of the canals of the old ice house ruins. The ice house burned down in 1929, the Berkshire Ice Company. And very quickly after that, Elaine and uh, May swept in and bought all the property. 
So in um, several years ago, Lee Swift, our local historian, went into our former executive director's office and said, you know, this is an incredible piece of Connecticut history. There's even a whole area of our museum dedicated to the ice house that was on Bantam Lake. And Lee said, you really should get volunteers and uncover all of the ruins of the ice house and we should make this a part, an interpretive trail for it. And that's exactly what we've done. So you can go and follow with QR codes um, the ice house, or you can ask for a pamphlet. You'll have to call beforehand a pamphlet about the ice house ruins. It's a spectacular piece of property. And you can even find charcoal on the ground still from the fire in 1929. But the entire footprint of the ice house has been um, exposed so you can uh, you know, learn all about it. I think that's such an ethereal picture. Tom Alina now lives out in California, but he's one of my best friends. When I lead geology trips up to Iceland, which I do when we can do them. Um, Tom is my geologist. He takes complex science and dumbs it down for people like myself. And so this was, uh, we were doing this for Connecticut Trails Days where we were exploring the geology of five ponds and uh, you're not allowed to harvest plants, obviously, or rocks on our property. Um, but Tom was allowed to do that because he's Tom. Again, river otter. Matt so we have a question. Is there a um, limit to the number of motorboats allowed on the lake? It's a huge lake and I don't know, but there are a lot of them there, but it's not like we have, you know, crashes and big, you know, problems that involve the law there. It's a huge lake. Um, the, the Connecticut DEP does have a, uh, does have a, a pretty brand new um, place for motorboats. Uh, yeah, is it as busy if you're a boat owner? Is it as busy as Highland Lake? It's probably tit for tat. I wouldn't be surprised if they're about the same. It's busy. I mean, if you're a kayaker and you're out there, I would, I would say go early in the morning before the motorboat people get out there. I don't think it would be so much fun. But there was also the Litchfield Rowing Club that goes out with their boats. Uh, and they go out very early in the morning to do their practice too. So, you know, if you're a motorboat owner, then, you know, look into bringing your boat up there. There's a launch, a DEP launch there. Um, but if you are uh, somebody with a canoe or a kayak, go out early or go out late um, because they, they do have a, every year, a, um, what are they, the skiers, like a ski jumping contest on the lake as well. Uh, so it's a busy lake. I have a lot of pictures. I really need to stop talking. These are some of the rehab faces that we've had, a uh, uh, red fox, um, short-tailed weasel, and a possum. We don't do rehab at White Memorial, but two of us on the staff are wildlife rehabilitators. Lois is now retired, and I'm only bats and porcupines, and I'm not allowed to do bats right now because of COVID. And the reason for that is not because of me getting sick from bats, it's from me spreading COVID to bats, which we don't need with white nose syndrome. So for all the flack that bats get for in inventing COVID, that's not the reason why I can't rehab them. The state is terrified that we might spread it to them and that's the last thing they need. I think that May, and Elaine would be thrilled with what they created. And I think also that they would be thrilled that, you know, people like Russ and I were talking before the program about how we have taken virtual programming and brought our messages about Meg's point about White Memorial to the world. And that is something very positive that's come out of this crisis. Um, this complete debacle has made us realize that, and we've always known there's a big world, but it's made us realize that our messages about conservation and education uh, can go across our nation and around the world. And that's, that's totally glasses half full stuff. And I'm a total glasses half full person. Of course, the whites, were alive during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Gordon Laurie, who is now close to 100 years old, was the first education director at White Memorial. 
and then it was Jeff and now it's Carrie. People go to White Memorial to work, they don't leave, they just retire. Um, that's why you know when you're offered a job there, it's once in a lifetime experience and it's an opportunity that you should not turn away. But Gordon is the only person in the world that banded one species of bird in one place for 50 years. And his specialty is the black cap chickadee. Without a doubt, the Little Pond Boardwalk is the most popular hike on the property, though it isn't for me the most beautiful. What makes the boardwalk so stunning? It's a one mile boardwalk that goes around Little Pond, and there are some aspects of it that are beyond breathtaking. But it also, if you're claustrophobic, you don't want to be out there on a summer day, um, unless you go out very early in the morning or very late. You can go out anytime. You can go on a moonlight walk. I would, you know, anytime you want to go and use this property, you can use it, but uh, it, this gets very busy and it also in the springtime gets flooded. And when we have things like hurricanes, like Irene, it gets hurt, um, but you can also get some pretty cool pictures of it in distress. And this is one of them. Again, the minutia of nature, just shooting through ice at all the leaf litter on below gives you kind of a soft, dreamy, I like it, it's pretty. Uh, we take our show on the road. This is Carrie with our education owl, Shakespeare, a barred owl uh, that was hit by a car. He has only one operating wing and was taught to sit on a gloved hand. He's just a super bird. And here we are at Burr Pond State Park at the Connecticut DEP's Winterfest a couple of years, excuse me, a couple of years ago. I, I pumped this up after Hurricane Irene um, just to make it more dramatic, but this is when Jeff was in place and Jeff and Jamie and I went to see the damage on the boardwalk, which was surprisingly little. Uh, but our guys were out there and they had that thing ready for use as soon as the water subsided. Um, the foundation guys are just incredible. Whoa, big snapping turtles on our property. Jerry, are you familiar with the Bass family? I have. Uh comment from someone on Facebook says the Bass family uh, owns 1400 acres deeded open spaces nearby. Um, do you know them or work with them? Um, I don't, but that doesn't mean anything because I'm in kind of my little world with White Memorial and I would love to know uh, about them. Now, I am sure that people on our board and our executive director, Lucas Heider, knows about them because they're totally on top of everything. I'm really more, I'm more um, leading hikes, developing programming, and I hear about things, but I, I'm not familiar with them. So God bless them for saving that land. That's incredible. That's really amazing. I don't know who they are. I will write this down though, and I will ask because I am certainly interested. I sometimes take um, hikes to other properties. I'll lead hikes at um, Prospect Mountain, Litchfield Land Trust has that, or to Sunnybrook and Torrington State Park because the whites kind of had their fingerprints in that. Um, but if these people have trails through that property, I would be interested in exploring that. This was a reading of the Wind in the Willows that we had in a screen house that we, we've got on the property several years ago. It's just, again, um, it's nice to have actors and poets, poets and authors like David K. Leff coming out and reading us uh, Thoreau and, uh, or even his own readings. I collaborate a lot with David Leff, who was the former deputy commissioner for the Connecticut DEP, a very good friend of mine now. And uh, if I call him and say, David, do you wanna do this program? He's game. He does incredible programs. I love him. And he, he, he loves food too. He's great. <laughs> I love David. We do old fashioned haying on the property sometimes just to show people how it's done just as we do old fashioned ice harvesting. There's Veronica again coming in for a landing to get a freebie. And here's the woman that all of that, those stones out there in, in the lake um, are part of the old ice house ruins. It's because of Lee Swift that we have this as such an important component of our education at White Memorial today. I, I, she's a very dear friend and I just adore her. Somebody's got a nice breakfast there. This was our recreation of uh, the Elaine and May adaptation of Through the Looking Glass. 
for the 100th anniversary. And it was just so much fun. I mean, the, the, they had their hands. They created that script. <laughs> just, they must have been the coolest people. Our big, big brown bat colony, again, monitored by the Connecticut Deep, lives in this barn. Uh, most of them are on the right side of the barn. You can come out and count bats with me sometime. And as I said, you know, when you saw in the earlier pictures of Whitehall, they use this for outdoor dining. Well, so do I. You know, I had a former career as a chef. And every Saturday after Thanksgiving, except last year, of course, um, I do a hike on the Cranberry Pond Trail. And if you're well behaved at the end, even if you're not well behaved, we will lay out a table of homemade crimson pies. And that is a pie that's made with cranberries and blueberries and have coffee and a thick ginger creme anglaise poured over it. And it's just a lovely way uh, to spend, um, to eat more during Thanksgiving weekend. This was a particularly snowy Saturday after Thanksgiving. And I think of all of these hikes, and I've done these for about a decade, um, this was my absolute favorite one because of these weather conditions. It was just beautiful. This will attract up to 80 people. And obviously we can't have it during COVID, but, um, but I, yeah. You want me to bake pie for 80 people? Bring it. We can do it. Here, kiss if there's cookie. pie, I'll be there. Yeah. Are you a pie person, Russ? Absolutely. I'm a pie person too. It's my favorite dessert. And it's also David Left's favorite. If I say, David, there's going to be pie at this event. If you do it, he'll be there. <laughs> Anything for a piece of pie. This pie recipe is especially outstanding. The porcupine in the upper right was my very first porcupine pacer, and she is now part, uh, she's taxidermied. She passed away inconveniently on my birthday several years ago. Um, I only had her for a couple of years, and she was a wonderful animal for education. Uh, pacer is now part of the Catlin Woods diorama in our beautiful nature museum. Flying squirrel on the left, cottontail rabbit on the uh, bottom right, and of course a big brown bat pup in my hand. This was another one of our 9-11 uh, memorials with Mount Tom in the background and Brian Bradley's beautiful uh, the, the, the Harris Hawk, yes, and my friend Lou Zygmunt. It's almost spiritual with a swoosh coming down to the daylight, the sunlight. Eastern Bluebird. Somebody's getting ready for spring. You can see she's shedding her winter coat. See the skunk cabbage in the background. And ice harvesting is something that we still do on the property every year. We have all of these old tools that were in the barn at Whitehall, and uh, we just decided to go out and start doing it on our own. So every year when COVID isn't around, we do a whole program on the history of ice harvesting at Bantam Lake. And then we get adults and children out on the ice, if it's safe, of course, to do their own harvesting. And it's fun. It makes you really appreciate how hard people worked way back when, and dangerous too, really, really dangerous. Thing to do. I love this photograph because the uh, the buck has velvet on his ears, uh, his ears on his horns, and um, you know Russ could probably speak more eloquently about this. But deer shed their horns every single year, and this is very bloody vascular. Uh, this velvet on their horns. I think that's really incredible um, that these animals lose their horns and grow back looking like that every single year. So you could be walking through the forest and you could find deer sheds. Russ, is this the time of year that they're losing them? Do you know? Yeah, we're coming up on it, it should be. Yeah, so if you're taking a walk in the forest, maybe you'll find a beautiful shed or two. A lot of times rodents get to them before you do because the rodents love to chew these. Some of the fun hikes that we do, we do uh, yeah, usually sometimes we do a Halloween spooky uh, hike where people dress up with their dogs and we go around the boardwalk and make complete fools of ourselves. And then there's a food reward at the end. I'm really big into food rewards. Um, there is a, this was an Easter hike. You can see people holding baskets and we go out the crack of dawn and dress funny and wear hats. And then I love this picture at the bottom because this was a, a February day, a beautiful February day. After, um, I think this was 2011, 2010, we had a winter to beat the band. And that was when people were stealing snow rakes and, and everybody was, if we got one more inch of snow and I love snow, I would have ju I just would have jumped off a roof somewhere probably into a pile of snow. And I was uh, going to do a hike at Five Ponds and we had a hundred people show up. 
and we don't have parking at five ponds for 100 people so we just did a wagon train around the little pond boardwalk but everybody's just like yes please get me out in nature get me out in nature it was just an amazing day this is the bantam river from the sutton bridge at little pond beautiful place for the reasons why people come out to White Memorial birding. If you are a birder extraordinaire, then you know about us already. If you're a novice birder, you will know about us. You can go on eBird and we're one of the hot spots in the state for birding. Is we've got such great diversity in habitat. Thanks to Elaine and May. Happy hikers. A very accommodating barred owl. Here's my friend Tom, who's also a meteorologist, great physicist, talking about clouds at Apple Hill. And a beautiful moon set on Mallard Marsh by Leo Kalinske. You know, winter might be full of grays and browns and whites and blacks, but um, winterberry really kind of breaks that up. I love the winterberry. Oh, I do too. The other one I love is the cardinal flower. It looks mm -hmm. almost it looks almost exotic, and of course that doesn't come out in the winter, but it's at that that pop of red. I love the picture of the children enjoying the boardwalk, um, Apple Hill, people hugging the King's Oak. You know, we saw the picture of the kids in it. They're, we're still being kids with the King's Oak. It's still there. There's the stone wall, all the trees behind it. It was once meadow. It's like a Christmas card. And we also do astronomy programs at White Memorial. We do have a wonderful amateur astronomy group, the Litchfield Hills Amateur Astronomy Club, that um, maintains a very big telescope in our sawmill field. We're very good for light pollution. The light you're seeing uh, beyond this picture at Apple Hill is probably from Waterbury, but it, White Memorial is still one of the best places where there's very little light pollution. So a lot of amateur astronomers um, come out to photograph the heavens. This is up at Apple Hill. There's Orion. You can see his belt. And again, it doesn't matter what season you go. What the whites have given us is in just absolutely blinding how kind they were and how they asked for nothing in return. Here's the money. Just take care of it. Maintain it. Hopefully you can help it grow. And, uh, you know, I think that their vision is being realized every single day, even with COVID, every single day their vision is realized. I feel that we're, you know, we're doing a, a I think we're doing a good job in serving their vision properly. This looks photoshopped, but it isn't. He took this on a very foggy day. This is again a Leo's. We have um, quite a few outbuildings on the property. The activity barn is uh, shed as one of my favorites. And this is a friend of mine that came down from Iceland to perform to a packed audience. We had over 100 people there. And again, I said we partnered with the Litchfield Rowing Club and they let some of our folks get in their boats and go out onto Bantam Lake. This is early in the morning again. Otherwise, that thing would be toppling over with motorboats passing by, but they do a lot of practice work there. It's, it's great. I mean, um, today I'm partnering with Russ and I love partnering with Flanders Nature Center and Ripley Waterfowl Conservancy and uh, the, the rowing club and anybody that wants to partner. We, we love sharing. We love sharing and spreading the word about all, all of our brother and sister you know, organizations. And of course, teaching kids. This is my dog, Bradley, who is licensed by the USDA um, because he mingles with people all the time and he loves kids. Kids and toys. He's not interested in steaks. He's part Labrador. He's a, he's a rescue. Um, but uh, there wasn't an animal that really came from um, rags and turned into riches. And Bradley's one of the luckiest dogs in the world. We're so lucky to have him and the kids just love him. He's taken children who are terrified of dogs. And by the end of a program, they're actually putting, you know, they're petting him and leading him on his lead. You know, I'm just grateful that when I chose to have a dog, I chose this one and he blends in so beautifully with programming at White Memorial. The kids are just great. I don't like to put in things that are um, invasive species in my presentations. I don't want to encourage, you know, purple loose strife and things like that, but you cannot deny this mute swan and its signets. So what a beautiful photograph. 
and the Ute Swan is an, 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 not a native species. So that's a beautiful photograph. Christmas at Whitehall obviously looks very different, but uh, we usually have a, a museum open house right before Christmas so people can come in and get discounts shopping and I fill you with cookies and candy bags and apple cider and music and we have a lot of fun together in the museum. The heroes of the Little Pond Boardwalk, night hikes, early kayaking on the Bantam Lake, and then I will set up a breakfast buffet on Litchfield Town Beach for folks. And then there's Carol Peralt uh, with her Easter bonnet on birding at uh, Bantam Lake on the old ice house ruins. This is an incredible photograph that Leo took. He didn't realize that he got the spider web. It's a two for one until he put it up on his computer. And I think it's one of the greatest photos he's ever taken. That's a huge spider web. This is a probably a 5 a.m. bird hike with Fran Zygmunt, another one of our volunteers. He's an incredible birder. He does owl hikes, owl prowls with us. And he mostly birds using his own voice. He very rarely will use a tape to call birds. He'll use his own voice. He knows them all. He is a freak, just a freak. Sorry about that. I thought I put that on Do Not Disturb. Summer camps for kids. We have day camps, not overnight camps. I guess we're doing some version of that this year. It's going to be stripped down, but at least we'll be able to get some kids out and play by the rules and do what we're supposed to do. This was just taken a few weeks ago of a female uh, hooded merganser. And this was one of those October snowstorms several years ago where you kind of got that contrast between autumn, we were still in it, and uh, the snow, pretty. An Eastern red bat that I rehabbed several years ago. One of our state threatened species that lives in maple trees. This is a migratory species. They're pretty rare. This is a male. You can tell the males from the females. The males are bright orange and the females are uh, more of a frosted, um, rusty colored. This is a little male. Uh, we do woodcock cocktail parties. No alcohol involved. It's just a play on words where I uh, set out a wonderful spread for folks, children and adults, and we do a program on the American woodcock, which is losing a lot of habitat. And then we go out and we usually uh, kind of uh, do some reconnaissance and find out where our woodcocks are going to be. This year, it was just in a, a field where we have an old chestnut grove. Um, that we work with the American Chestnut Foundation, again, with a chestnut grove there. And this was an incredible woodcock cocktail party. The males were going crazy. If any of you uh, are not familiar with the American woodcock, it's one of my favorite birds, especially because of this mating ritual, which is comical. Me, me. I heard some down at your place, Russ, uh, when I did a program there um, not so long ago. And then the males will spiral up in the air and you really can't see them unless it's moonlight, it's getting twilight out. And then they just drop to the ground and start meep, meep, meeping again. And it's comical and it's one of the greatest uh, mating displays in ornithology. So we're so blessed to have great habitat for the American woodcock here on our property. And again, look for the reflections. These are cattails, and I just thought it was kind of a fun, odd, you know, uh, abstract in nature. Our largest species of woodpecker, peck, the pileated, pileated or pileated. I think I say that every single picture of Leo's is one of my favorites. This is one of my favorites, sincerely. Um, it's like uh, the Santa's reindeer are practicing for Christmas to be walking up on the Apple Hill, Laurel Hill Trail and witness this in a snowy morning. It's still one of Leo's favorite photographs, just spectacular. Sleepy guy. These are all Judith Thurman Shapiro again. She's pretty handy with the camera. That's Chickadee Bridge on the lower left. We were on top of it for the celebration of the Bantam River with Robin Dinda all decked out. That's what it looks like from a boat. 
very, very popular. Bantam River is a very popular place to kayak, but be prepared because you're going to have to go over beaver dams. The beavers have their way with that river every year. Love this photograph Matt Belmus took of a barred owl in the first snow. And Leo's spectacular books. Leo's actually written a book, a self-published book with all of his photographs of uh, the Bantam Lake Eagles. You can go to his website. He's leokolinskyjr.com. And K-U-L-I, you can see here, K-U-L-I-N-S-K-I, leokolinskyjr.com, because he's got running photographs. If you're somebody that loves Olympic runners and um, pictures of Carlos Santana that have been published. And uh, again, mostly it's wildlife. That's what I think his niche really is, but he's done other things. This is Matt Balmus, Bobcat. Matt, and you know, people often ask what kind of cameras these guys have. Well, they're probably bigger cameras than what you and I have, but they're not Paul Fusco cameras with a $10,000 lens. They're all just really nice cameras with a fairly decent zoom. Nothing that is out of reach in terms of, you know, affordability, if you really want to get into photography like this. It takes a good eye and patience. Or it takes an iPhone like I do to take a picture like this. <laughs> This is such a beautiful, I love this tree. Again, the brave old oak at Cat Swamp, a different autumn. Uh, this was early morning. I just am so nuts about this tree. There was a mother, a doe with a twin fawns this past year that were so comfortable around people. You know, again, we don't say, you know, touch them or try to approach them. Um, at all, but they are ready for their photo ops. The wildlife on our property is very, very accustomed to humans because they know they're safe. I often will lead a sunset hike up to the top of Apple Hill, and this is just one of those incredible days. And again, in the spirit of your quote, uh, Russ, from the beginning of the program, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, I started to do a program called the Snow Queen in December, uh, several years ago. We started it up in 2010 and then it went to bed for a while because I don't want to charge people for this. So I have one donor who gives me the money to bring Santa and Mrs. Claus and these horses to White Memorial and to bring a wonderful puppeteer and felt artist, uh, Robin McCahill, to do a big program, a big puppet program about the Snow Queen. And then I make hot chocolate and cookies for a crowd of 100 or 200, maybe even more people. And it's free to the public. But the caveat is that the public gives us money and clothing and non-perishable foods to our local shelter. And for me, here is one generous donor that has made this possible to the public for free. It's all about paying it forward. And, uh, you know, again, it's what the whites did for us. The whites gave us this incredible property, you know, just the kindest, most giving people. And I feel, you know, as much as we possibly can, that we need to, we need to emulate that. And we need to do that too in our com community. And especially in this day and age where people can be so, it's all about me and children can get so swept up in material things and goo and stuff that doesn't matter, um, TV shows and things like that. Uh, it's important to teach them lessons like that. And, you know, it makes me so proud that, that I can do a program like this every year for Fish of Northwestern Connecticut. How did Carol get that picture? Once again, it's all, all about being patient. All about being patient. To get a toad in a toadstool, only at White Memorial. <laughs> Jerry, I'll have to say what these pictures are telling me is the, the land and the property that the whites left to the people are priceless because it, there are a lot of priceless images you have right there. Thank you. And you know, once again, Russ, it's all about, I, you've, got to, you've got to come out someday. I will lay out the red carpet for you. You can come up and do a program for us someday, if you can ever get away from Meg's Point, because I know that you're kind of ball and chain there. I almost feel like it's like a fabulous prison for you. 
<laughs> <laughs> there is such thing as a fabulous person. It's White Memorial and it's Meg's Point. But yes, um, we have a very special place and a lot of people still don't know about us. And that's kind of the interesting thing, but they know about us now uh, through COVID. Uh, when a lot of the state parks closed, um, that's when people fled to White Memorial because the only thing that was closed was the Little Pond Boardwalk for a while. There is a, a big memorial uh, rock at the Five Ponds area, which is really, it's so beautiful. And people that aren't prepared for it stumble on it and they gasp because it's lovely. And let me see if I can remember because some people are standing in front of it. But in it, it says, in most grateful memory of Elaine and May White, brother and sister who loved the quiet and beauty of the forest. Of, no, of the, it's the forest or the woods and who saved these thousands of acres for us. Um, again, I would be hard pressed to think of two greater land conservationists in Connecticut than Elaine and May, over 10,000 acres preserved. Um, but there may be others and God bless them. Every single person, every single land trust every single person through history that has saved a precious part of the state. You know, we've got 3 million people that live in our tiny state of Connecticut. In Iceland, where I travel frequently when I can, a state the size of Kentucky has 380,000 people living on it. We've got 3 million in Connecticut and that there are still um, ham and assets and white memorials and Kent Falls, a state park system that protects us. It's, you know, I always say to children, it's not, about, um, you know, wildlife sanctuaries aren't just about wildlife and saving plants and things like that. It's, it's stuff that we need. And I know, Russ, that you've experienced this through COVID and we certainly experienced it, how important open space is to us. I just heard on the news a couple of weeks ago that some doctors are prescribing now as medicine, and this is medicine, getting out in nature get some fresh air, get outside, you know, go to one of Russ's programs, come out for a hike with, with me whenever we can do that. You know, get out there in nature because it is a bomb. It is a salve, it is a medicine. It's something that um, it, each and every one of us needs. So many people from New York City have fled to the Northwest corner to buy property during COVID to get out of the, to get out of the riffraff and, and COVID. Um, you know, it's, it, we need nature. And, uh, and again, I think that, you know, we're doing everything that we can to, to maintain May and Elaine's legacy. Uh, and again, I, like I said, I am, I'm entirely grateful that I was invited to come and sit in my chair uh, to work at White Memorial as Director of Administration and Development. Um, it was a once in a lifetime job. It is a once in a lifetime job. People just don't leave White Memorial. You never do. You retire, you die. <laughs> it's as simple <laughs> as that. We, we know that we are the most fortunate people in the world to be able to bring their message um, to the world and, you know, and to our own nooks and crannies here in Connecticut and across the nation and around the world. This is a list of everybody that contributed uh, to this program. Some of them are no longer with us. I miss them dearly, people that were at the Conservation Center a lot. And one of my favorite trails just off our main campus is the Pine Island Trail. I feel like it's something out of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, and again, you know, I thank you, Russ and Lori, so much for inviting me here today to spread the word about May and, and Elaine. And again, as I said, she was the silent partner in a force that changed the face of Northwestern Connecticut and our state forever. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. A lot of people are talking about how beautiful the pictures were. Thank you. On Facebook and thanking you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm, I am absolutely thrilled once again to see you, Russ, even though it's virtually and to partner with Meg's Point and uh, really look forward to uh, you and Carrie doing some diabolical plan together one of these days. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, for White Memorial, come and see us, you know, look at our website, whitememorialcc.org. 
uh, there, we've got a lot, a lot to offer. We've got some really cool programs coming up, virtual programs. Ours are usually on Saturdays. I'm not stepping on Russ's toes at all. Uh, but, you know, some of them are for a little bit of a fee and others are, many of them are for free. Some of them are streamed on Facebook Live as well because Russ and I have just realized the virtues of Zoom to Facebook Live and how many people we can reach. And, and Russ, was, we were talking before about um, how many people we have touched since we all shut down. And I think you guys and, and White Memorial shut down about the same time, mid-March of last year. So it's been almost a year. And for us, uh, we have educated around our nation and around the world about uh, 20,000 people. And for Russ, who is virtual seven days a week, four times a day, <laughs> this, you've got to have like 30,000 or 50,000 people that have, have seen your programs. Isn't that I, amazing? I think, I think the number that have viewed our programs is over 100,000. Okay, I'm lowballing it. I apologize. <laughs> and here I was like, yeah, we've done 20,000 people. I don't even want to go tell Carrie that you've done 100,000. Uh, <laughs> that's just absolutely amazing. So, you know, again, that is the good thing that's come out of COVID is our ability to reach out to you virtually. We knew it was available to us before. We never utilized it. And when COVID shut us down, it forced our hand. It forced us to, um, to reach out to you virtually. And the response has just been extraordinary. So Russ, thank you again so much. Well, I want to thank you. I want to let everybody know that this uh, program will be up on our YouTube channel uh, eventually. And you can watch it again and again. You can also see it on our website, megspointnaturecenter.org, if you visit the uh, Virtual Learning Center. So go to YouTube, go to the Virtual Learning Center, uh, watch this program and many others. Make sure you visit White Memorial. Um, mm -hmm. Sure that you will enjoy and learn from all of the programs that are that are coming out of there. So until next time. And visit our property right now. Again, the museum's closed, but you can be out there taking pictures just like Leo. You feel like you want to take a little drive, um, take a little drive up to Litchfield. And, uh, you know, there's some great restaurants that are open, all the social distancing, you know, stuff in place, bring your mask. But, um, but again, uh, come out and use that property that is so important to people right now. And um, that's so wonderful that, you know, that we have remained closed and that people are making an exodus to us to, to be in nature. So come out and enjoy our 4,000 acres. We would love to have you. All right. Well, Thanks a lot, Russ. Thank you. You have a great day. And until next time, we're gonna sign off. So we will end here soon. Thank right. you all for tuning in and we will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>